As you find your seats, if you could open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. What we're going to be studying over the next few weeks is this, are the daily themes that go along. I'm so excited about this. So excited to share over the next few weeks the, so, some truths, some scriptures, some concepts that we can wrestle with and begin to apply in our lives that come from the daily themes that the kids are going to hear at Vacation Bible School. And the idea behind this is, you know, it's hard to give away something that you haven't first received. And so it's like, hey, let's get in on this stuff and begin to get this. This is the theme of Vacation Bible School, rock solid. And the idea is each of the daily themes, we're going to look at some of the different characteristics of how God wants to make our lives so incredibly solid. Not because we've got our act together and we're like, yes, look how solid I am. You know, solid, you know. It's not like that, that we are solid. It's that He is solid. And as we tap into Him, we get a supernatural sense of confidence and peace and joy and love. I mean, all this incredible stuff that we don't have to strive for to be like, oh, I want to be so good. I want to be loving. I'm such a miserable failure. I want to be better than that. No, it's not this self-help nonsense. Sorry if you're into self-help. I didn't mean to be (laughs) offensive. But, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, it just, you know, if you could fix yourself, you would have done it by now, right? But yet how often do we fall into the trap? All of us, where there's always a battle and there's always a struggle, will I really trust in God to give me a confidence and to give me a peace and to give me a joy and to give me a love that I could never get on my own? See, Romans 7 is really interesting. It says that our flesh, our old self, the one that isn't going to heaven, the one that's going to rot and go away, you know, that one, our old self, It has the ability to want to do good. So our flesh, our old self is like, I want to be loving. But it doesn't actually have the ability to be loving. I want to be loving, but I can't. So this feeling of like, always feeling kind of one step behind. Always feeling like I don't measure up. This feeling of, ah, I just feel so insecure in who I am and what I think and and, and all this stuff. Everyone else seems so spiritual and I just feel so lame. You know, we're looking at maybe in other people the work of the Spirit. I mean, this incredibly powerful um, ability to have peace, joy, love, all this, the fruit of the Spirit, to have all this stuff flowing out. We're looking at people who aren't being empowered by their own ability, but are actually being empowered by God. And we see what's flowing out of their life, and we think, I could never do that. And do you know what the Bible says about our flesh? Our flesh can't do that. So when you think to yourself, I could never do that, you know what? You're right. You can't. But what we can do is give our weakness to to Jesus and he can give us a strength. And the, the, the Romans 5.17 calls it the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. It says, you know, do you want the gift of righteousness that can reign in life? Do you want impulses and drives and compulsions to do right? To be loving. That's rock solid love when you just can't help but be loving. It just flows out of you. Just like in your old self, how you don't have to try to be selfish. It's just like, yes, it's all about me, me, me. You know, we all have this flesh that we still drag around with us. And it's the ball and chain. We're like, oh, I'm so over it. But there's another part of us that's just like, yes, I love being loving. And it what, what's actually true is the righteousness of God flows out of this part of our being even more naturally, even more fully, even more freely than the sin that flows out of It's a greater, stronger flowing river. The righteousness of God that can flow from within us is even more powerful and more natural than the sin that came through our old nature. But the 
the trick. I mean, that sounds like it's tricky. It's not. It's not. I mean, it's only tricky because it doesn't come naturally, but it's not a trick. The thing is to stop trying to be righteous on our own. And again, to tap into God, to tap into a righteousness that he alone can give us. So that's what we're going to be talking about is how do I exchange my weakness, my insecurity, my inability for this incredibly powerful reality that God wants to invite us into. The verse, the, th- the key verse for the Monday's theme that we're going to be studying today is it's rock, the, the theme is rock solid in love. All right, rock solid in love. And the key verse that the kids will be learning is 1 John 4.19. 1 John 4.19. And it says this, we love, see if you can tie it in with what I was just saying about the life and the power and the love of God flowing through us. Listen to what 1 John 4.19 says. We love because he first loved us. Okay? We love because he first loved us loved us. Now, before I get further into the context, because we're going to look at, the, at the, the bigger chunk of first, uh, first John chapter 4 to get more of the context of what does that mean and how does that work. Before I dive into that, I want to explain that in the Bible, there are three different Greek words that are used to translate the word love. Uh, you might have heard this before. There's the Greek word eros, that is the root for our word erotic. There's the erotic love. And erotic love is, is uh, it's that passionate love. You know, it's, it's like hubba hubba. You know, it's like woo. You know, it's just, it's chemicals and it's hormones. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's just, it takes over and it just sweeps you into it, Okay. It's, I don't need to explain further. You, you, get, you get it. It's emotional. It's chemical. It's hormonal. There's just all kinds of stuff. And what's interesting about, a couple things about erotic love, it's primarily, or yes, I will say that, it's primarily selfish in nature. Uh, it's, it wants what it wants. All of this energy and emotion is the drive to get what it wants. And if erotic love is denied, it gets quite grumpy. Does this make sense? The second thing that's interesting about it is that you don't choose it. You can't flip it on or flip it off. Sounded bad, but you know what I mean. You're walking down the... (laughs) You're walking down the street, and I don't care if you're happily married and committed to your spouse, there will be times where someone's walking down the street the opposite direction, and it's like hubba hubba, the the, the arrow stuff starts happening. You can't turn that off. It just will happen, or it won't happen, based on a whole variety of factors that we don't have time uh, to talk about right now. But you don't really choose it. It just happens. Now, phileo is another Greek word that the Bible uses to describe love. Phileo is brotherly love. And brotherly love is what happens uh, when a group of people will spend a bunch of time doing something that they enjoy together, and they'll just have a lot of fun doing that, and then after enough time, they just start feeling a whole lot of affection and a whole lot of loyalty and a whole lot of camaraderie, all of these things. This is all phileo. It's like, yeah, bros, yeah, what's up? Oh, yeah, high fives all around. You know, it's the, it's the team spirit that develops. It's phileo. Now, what's interesting about phileo is that it is also quite selfish in nature. I love you because I like doing what I like doing with you. Okay? But if that common interest is taken away, life, life happens, you know? We don't, and we just don't spend time, but it's like that, that phileo can drift actually quite quickly because it's really about each other's mutual satisfaction around this shared experience. Similarly uh, to Eros, you also can't turn it on or turn it off. You spend enough time doing something that you enjoy with a group of people, and phileo will develop. And this is one of the great risks of church is that we get a bunch of people all having fun, enjoying time, doing things similarly together, and it can develop actually phileo, which is rather selfish in nature. We enjoy what we're doing together, but it doesn't actually compel us into something that is truly spiritual. 
we can't actually even turn it off or turn it on. You enjoy, if you enjoy what you're doing with a group of people, phileo will develop. Does this make sense? Now, agape is the third kind, and it's truly spiritual. It's the stuff that really God is all about. And it's something, a couple things about it. Um, it's completely unselfish, whereas the other two are at least significantly selfish, if not primarily selfish. Agape is completely selfless. Jesus says no greater agape is the Greek word. No greater agape has anyone than this that he laid down or she laid down her life for uh, her friends. So it's this choice to lay down my life, to disadvantage myself for the sake of encouraging or building up someone else. And if I'm doing that, if I am giving up something that I would enjoy, that I would love, giving up my time and energy, emotions, whatever I'm doing, I'm laying so that you can be stoked, then I'm agapeing you. But secondarily, so not only is it unselfish, opposite of the other, it also can only be entered into through choice. Does this make sense? We will never accidentally develop agape. (laughs) And we will never accidentally lay down our life for someone else. It won't just develop. It's a purposeful choice. Not only the giving of agape, but also the receiving of agape. I will never accidentally receive the benefit of you laying your life down for me. I will be like, oh, no, 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 you shouldn't have. Or I will say, thank you. Wow, that amazes me. Does this make sense? There will be a fork in the road, and I will choose to give it. I will choose to receive it, or I will choose to not give it, and I will choose to not receive it. So that's very integral into this understanding of agape. And the amazing thing about God is that he always, 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 always chooses agape. He chooses to give his life, to disadvantage himself for our sake, and he chooses to receive our agape when we lay down our lives in worship and service to him. He never rejects us. He always accepts us. He never says, oh, you shouldn't have when we give ourselves in service to him. He always says, oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. Come on, let's do this more. I'll serve you. You serve me. It's going to be great. Make sense? So agape. All right, so backing up, still in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Beloved, that in that word is the root of agape. So he gives them the title, uh, the apostle John does, of agapid. He says, hey, you agaped ones, you, you, you loved ones. Let us love, let us agape one another. Let's lay our lives down for each other. For love, this ability to lay down our lives for each other, is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is is love. Okay, so just starting off, we get this understanding that love is from God. Now, this is an incredibly powerful and freeing understanding if we can grab a hold of it, because if we're not, if we see ourselves as people who have room to grow in love, one of the traps that we can instantly fall into is to get, fall into this thinking, I want to become more loving. You know, I'm impatient, I'm unkind, I'm kind of a jerk. I should really be more loving, okay? It doesn't work. Because where does love come? Does it come from within me? Can I generate love by deciding to be more loving? I can act loving. Remember, the flesh has the desire to be loving, but it can't actually do it. I can act loving, but at some point, that's going to fall short I'm going to turn back into the jerk, except I'm going to be a worse jerk because I'm like, what's your problem? I was so nice to you, right? It's not actually selfless. All my flesh knows how to do is to barter and exchange and make deals, and I'll, tr- I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. But to be truly loving, uh, he goes into how does this come, but it comes as we as we connect with God because he is the source of love and as we connect with him and spend time with him deeply and intimately what will happen is love will begin to develop in our life but he goes into more of explaining how do we actually do that verse 
9, by this, now this is part of his explanation, by this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Oh man, there's so many sermons in this. I would love to teach one just on that verse, but I'm going to keep going because it gets even a little bit more clear. Verse 10, in this is love. Again, he's going to drive home this point again. Not that we loved God. What? Wait, you're saying that love is not found in me loving God? No, that's the same problem I was just saying. It's not us. We don't have the ability in and of ourselves. You want rock-solid love? Do not put your hope or your effort or your energy into trying to love God. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. That's all we're supposed to do is love God, right? Well, yes, but you have to listen and pay attention to how do you end up loving God? You, the end goal is to love God. So I'm saying don't love God, but you do actually want to love God. You just have to know how to get there. Does it make sense? It's very counterintuitive. If you go straight for loving God, you're going to end up really being bitter at God. God, I love you. I love you so much. Why don't you bless me more? That's where it'll go. Make sense? We'll have all this expectation. I loved you with everything I had. Why didn't you treat me better? Right? So it doesn't work to try to go straight at loving God. We got to come in the door that he's created, and that door is named Jesus Christ. And here's how it works. He says, uh, it, 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 and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. This is the way into this rock-solid love. Not that we loved him, but he loved us and sent his son to be the, ooh, big scary word, propitiation, to be the propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? That means he paid the price for our sins. So the wrong that we do, we talked about this a bit after our worship set there a little bit ago. The wrong that we do, the guilt and the shame that we feel, the sense of heaviness, the sense of distance. Remember I was saying how if you do something, if you violate someone who's close to you, there's a gap that develops in the relationship. It's like, ah. It's just not so close and warm and fuzzy like it was, right? Well, in our relationship with God, what happens is we do these wrong things. There's this gap that develops. But when it says that Jesus is the propitiation, it means that he he paid the price. Propitiation means when someone pays the debt for you. It's a substitute payment. He took that gap on himself. And so when it says that Jesus was hanging on the cross and the Father turned his back on him, Jesus was taking that that gap that we feel and he took it, he was rejected by God so that we can be accepted by him. He was condemned, he took the penalty of sin so that we could be freed. And this is what's so powerful. This is where love is begins to erupt in our lives is when we begin to understand that love develops when we give our weaknesses to God, not when we give him our strengths. Because when I said a minute ago, if we go straight for trying to love God, what we're trying to do is be loving. We're trying to actually give him our strengths. And God's just, sorry, not that impressed. What he actually wants is your weakness. He wants, he wants us at our worst. And at our worst, see, it works so the opposite as everything else in our life. You know when you started having the hots for that boy or that girl way back in junior high school, and you're like, oh, I'm going to win their affections. Did you come at your worst? You know, with boogers hanging out your nose and, you know, a big zit ready to pop and everything. You're like, hey, do you love me? No, no, no. You try and clean everything up and slick your hair and... Hey, baby. You know, you're like trying to present yourself as something attractive and wonderful, and we think that that's what inspires love. Oops. See, when we try to do this with God, it's exact that that this is what can happen. Because what God wants is for us to come, this unconditional agape stuff, this agape stuff is no matter how bad you are, no matter where you're at, no matter what's messed up in your life, I love you. And it's not until we come actually at our worst. How do you know that God loves you until you come at your worst? 
Does this make sense? How do you know that he loves you until you come at your worst? If it's like, let's clean up our act and then, well, hello, God. How do we know that he wouldn't reject us if we came at that spot? Does this make sense? So we come and we give him our guilt. We give him our shame. We give him our failure. And we trust that that pain, that suffering, that rejection that he endured on the cross, that that was actually him, that we can actually, this is a trip, that we can give him that heaviness, that we can give him, it's like, like actually give him the burden and the heaviness that we feel. And really unburden it. And when we've successfully done that, if we've really understood that he suffered, like really, really suffered. I mean, there was the physical stuff, but the physical stuff was a flea bite compared to the emotional, psychological, and spiritual trauma of having his father turn his back on him. Because you know, when you suffer rejection, maybe you have an acquaintance, like you know, if you've ever had some, oh, a co-worker you know, gossip about you, it tears you up, right? I mean, it's hard to sleep. You're just like, oh, what's the matter? What's their problem? Ah, it just it, 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 it affects you. If you have a family member do that same thing, it tears you up deeper. If you have a spouse walk up to your face and say, I hate you. I never want to see you again. It destroys you. But see, none of us have had the kind of eternal intimacy with God that Jesus did. I mean, it's like the more intimate you are, the deeper the agony when that rejection comes. But Jesus had an infinitely deep intimacy with the Father. And so when the Father said, I reject you, it shredded the very essence of his being. I mean, it was like the physical stuff. It wasn't, he didn't even cry out. It says he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. He didn't even raise his voice. With all the physical stuff that happened, he was silent. It was at that moment of rejection that he cried out with a loud voice. That's what was happening. And so if we understand he really, really suffered. And so I can take this agony, this pit in my stomach, and this guilt and this shame and this heaviness. I can actually give it to him because what he was suffering on the cross is so that I could he, that's what he was suffering and so why try to what when i try to carry that through on my own i'm trying we might not know this psycholo- like uh, it, it, um, consciously we might not be aware that this is what we're doing but when we're like you know oh god i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i'm so, i'll do i won't do it again I, I promise i'll just change i promise i'll really this is us we're laboring with guilt and shame And in that process, what we're trying to do is we're trying to pay a price to prove, to earn our righteousness. But what's happening as we're trying to pay that price is we're double paying. God's disgusted by that. He's like, why are you trying? You are trying. You are invalidating the price that my son paid. The more you struggle, the more you're saying, Jesus, I don't believe that you paid for my sins. I believe my shame and I believe my guilt more than I believe your promise to forgive me. And so Jesus invites us to boldly and actively take these things that when we're at our worst, not try to fix ourselves, not try to recommend ourselves, not try to promise we won't do it again. Just take that vomitous bile that's down there and leave it with him and then Be so giddy with the excitement and the elation that you've been set free. And what happens at that, when you know that you've been loved and accepted and forgiven at your worst, what happens, it's it's a spiritual transformation. We get given a new heart. We are empowered because God has loved us at our worst. We are then empowered to love other people at their worst. But until we've been loved at our worst, not just once. This is not just a one time. This is like on a daily basis. This is a moment by moment, day by day thing. And that's why what Colin said during worship was so perfect. This story never gets old because we struggle with this stuff on a daily basis. And so it's just that moment by moment, daily thing of, God, I feel terrible right now, but woohoo! Blah! walking away with our head held high 
You do that. See, here's, a, here's, here's an episode that illustrates this principle. Uh, during Jesus' life at one point, uh, there was a prostitute. He was hanging out at one of the religious leaders' house, this Pharisee who was like, I'm so awesome. And I'll, I'm so awesome that I'll invite Jesus, the low man on the totem pole that he is. I'll invite that dirty scoundrel to come over to my house. So he invites Jesus to come over. And this woman comes, knocks on the door, comes in because she wants to see Jesus. She's like, I wonder how this is going to go because usually prostitutes aren't allowed to come into Pharisees' homes. And the Pharisee is a little bit shaken when she comes in because, you know, Pharisees aren't supposed to have prostitutes because the word might get out. What was she doing in there? And he's a little bit shaken and flustered. But when she comes in, there's just tears streaming down her face. And she comes and bows at Jesus' feet and the tears are coming down onto his feet and streaking the dust and the grime that are on his feet. And so she's taking her hair and she's washing his feet with her hair. And Jesus turns to the Pharisee and he reads his mind. He says, yeah, you were a little bit challenged when she came in. You were a little bit flustered by that, weren't you? He's like, yeah. I mean, if you knew what she did for a living, you wouldn't let her, you wouldn't even let her, t- you wouldn't let her in the house, you wouldn't, definitely wouldn't let her touch you, she's unclean. And Jesus said, hey, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a guy, really rich dude, who had two people who owed him money. One owed him $10 billion, and the other owed him $10. And he was so cool, he just said, hey, f- don't worry about it. I know you're having a hard time, just skip it. And he said, who do you think loved him more, the $10 billion debtor or the 10? Who was more stoked, who was more happy, who was more overjoyed? The guy that he forgave the $10 billion or the guy that, say, that he forgave the $10? And the, Pharise- the religious guy said, well, duh, of course, the $10 billion. And he said, well, this is actually the very situation we now find ourselves in because I walked into your house and you didn't offer me anything. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't even say hello. You just scowled at me. But when she came in, she came with tears coming down her face and she hasn't stopped weeping and thanking me because she knows that I've forgiven her. And he said, this is the line that he said at the end of that interaction. He said, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. The sad thing about the Pharisee was he had a lot of sin. He had this self-righteousness, this I'm better than other people routine. And that's what's going to happen if we try and become more loving. If we, I'm going to be loving, I'm going to work through this guilt, I'm going to become a perfect person, we'll end up like that Pharisee, so self-righteous. But see, that self-righteousness is actually more disgusting to God than the prostitution and all the whatever this woman did. Because the, 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 the self-righteousness is actually even condescending to Jesus. I don't need your sacrifice. I don't need your help. I can figure it out on my own. But to get this, that, I mean, obviously that's not loving. But to get this, this love that wells up from within that you can't even help. But letting it spill out, it just overwhelms you. You feel compassion. You feel affection. You feel just an embrace towards the Lord and towards other people. You want this kind of thing that just begins to take over your life? Here's the hot ticket. Become really active in giving those moments of... Give it to Jesus and then say, Hallelujah, you paid the price so that I could be set free. You do that again and again and again and again, and this love will overwhelm you, and it will take over your life, and you will have rock-solid love. (laughs) Amen? Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you that you love us so much. You say that you see us as a pure and spotless bride, and I just can't wait for that day when we come down the aisle and we look in your eyes and we see just the incredible joy and delight, the tears streaming down your face, not of agony, but of great, great, incredible, overwhelming delight and joy. And thank you, Lord, that that's how you see us even now. Through whatever it is that we've got going on in our lives, you never lose sight of who you've made us to be of the pure, spotless bride that you are creating us to be. And yet, Lord, you don't put the pressure on us to achieve that on our own. Your word is so clear. 
that on this side of heaven, we are also impure. Your word says we're like a whore. We betray all that we stand for and all that we believe in on a very regular basis. But Lord, you're not intimidated by that because you've already paid the price to erase that filth and to, 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 to erase that gap, that distance in the relationship that we would have with God. So Father, I pray that you'd give us great courage to continue to turn to you in moments of weakness and failure, that we wouldn't wallow for even an instant in that guilt and shame, but that we would be bold and courageous to give you that shame because you already paid the price, that we could be set free in the joy and the life and the love and the power and the peace and the intimacy that you designed us to enjoy with you, Lord Jesus, and with your Father. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we say. Amen. All right, everyone, thank you so much. I'm so excited to continue to explore these rock-solid truths that can transform our lives. Amen? All right, we'll see you around. Bye-bye.